All right, guys, this is a deer hunt breakdown compilation podcast. Sounds complicated. It's not. We've got top pros from Seek One, Driven, The Hunting Public, and Heartland Bowhunter all breaking down exciting hunts, unique hunts, different hunts, dissecting the why that put them sitting behind some big bucks, right? So we're going into big detail there. But that's not it. If you go over to the Vortex Optics YouTube channel, you can watch and learn from these hunts. They're concise video versions with some great info, but just not as much as we got on the podcast. So that's why we're here. Time to listen and learn. All right. What is up, everybody? First up, we have Mr. Aaron Warbritton from The Hunting Public coming at us live from his pickup in the middle of Kansas. But we're not talking about Kansas today. We're talking about a hunt recap of a Georgia muzzleloader buck, a really cool hunt, an exciting hunt. You guys put together that that uh, concise video with some awesome tips. So if you want to check out that video as well as some other great videos, head over to the YouTube channel, the Vortex Optics YouTube channel. You can see it all there. But for us now, for your listening pleasure, and actually if you're watching on the Vortex Nation podcast YouTube channel, you can see them too. Aaron, give us a recap of that hunt because you guys had a lot going on, a lot happened, a lot of big stuff happened, including a big buck. Yeah, dudes. Um, thanks for having me on, first of all. But uh, there was a lot of things that went into that sort of leading up to that hunt. Um, if you're familiar with hunting the South, it's a lot of thick woods, uh, like clear cuts, big pines. I mean, there, there's just not a lot of opportunity to observe deer. I mean, it's completely the polar opposite of where I'm at right now in Kansas, where you're glassing bucks from eight, nine tenths of a mile away. So down there, you rely almost solely on sign and just your occasional glimpse of a deer. I mean, we hunted like four or five days and did not see a deer at the beginning of this trip. So that just provides you with a little bit of context as to what was going on in this particular hunt. But we basically hunted this area from multiple sides and started finding deer sign around the edges of it and then dove in to the center of it on our last day there for a morning hunt. And the, the only way we could consistently get on deer was by still hunting ridges. So basically the, the way this sets up is there's a, there's a big ridge and then there's a bunch of finger ridges that lay off that almost like a hand. And what we did is we popped up and over each one of those finger ridges. And we would pop up over, over top of one of them and glass into the, into the next drainage, call a little bit glass for 30 minutes. And then once we cleared that next ridge and the next drainage, we would hustle through it and then back up the other side. And then we would repeat that process again. Well, eventually we ran into this really big buck and several other bucks chasing this doe out of some mountain laurel. I mean, as we were in the process of still hunting up the top of one of those ridges. and didn't get a shot at him. Long story short, uh, me and Gooch tried to get in position to shoot. I had a muzzle loader. The deer was 150 yards away, but it was through the timber and he was moving constantly. It was very difficult to get a shot. And I, I had a few questionable opportunities that I passed on. And eventually that doe got sick of looking at three dudes standing on the, the you know, adjacent open ridge and she blew and she took off. But the main lesson from this hunt is that we didn't stop. Uh, you know, I was pretty dejected because we'd been hunting for a week and all of a sudden here's this huge buck in an area where you hardly ever see a buck period. And there's a huge one right here in front of us. So we, you know, 10 years ago, I might've just gave up and headed back to the truck. But now I'm thinking to myself about the, the situation and we constantly bring it back to that, like preaching situational hunting tactics. That's, that's kind of our bread and butter. That's what we always revert to. And that, that situation was unique in the fact that there was a hot doe. It was a, a after peak rut. So this must have been one of the last few does that was in heat. And there was three bucks on her, including this guy. And none of those bucks had a care in the world about us. They were solely focused on that doe. And what typically happens if you softly bump a deer like that, in almost any case, they run three, four, five hundred yards to the next patch of thick cover, and then they settle back down. So we pulled out on X and we start looking at the map about in, in the direction that they went and, and start thinking about, okay, where's the next likely place for them to head? 
and then stop again because the, the doe was the only one that got nervous. So we went in hot pursuit um, and we started clearing ridges again in the direction that they went, you know, just still hunting those ridges. And I think the fourth or fifth ridge back, right about that four or 500 yard mark, we cleared a ridge and we heard a deer cough in the drainage below us in the Mount Laurel. And eventually we got eyes on him down there. And they did exactly what we had thought. They moved four or 500 yards, got into some thick stuff in the bottom of one of those drainages, and we picked them up again right there. And after that, it was just a matter of getting in position to shoot him, you know, without alerting those deer. But I think a lot of people give up on that. You know, I mean, I, like I said, I certainly would have years ago. I would have, I would have just chalked it up as a failure. You know, I spooked him and let's go find another one somewhere else. But we've had more and more success over the years, continuing to pursue those deer and, and not waiting. I mean, we immediately went after them yeah. once we bumped them. Yeah, Warb, that was probably one of my biggest questions is, is like after you guys bumped him and you started clearing those ridges, you said it was four or five ridges, how much time had passed from you guys bumping him to you guys finding him? And, and in that gap, did you guys let it kind of cool down for a little bit or did you guys just immediately go? Um, in a different situation, we might have let it cool down. But in, in this one, we knew there was a hot doe. So – at those those bucks are going to push her somewhere where they they get comfortable but as you know when they're rutting like that and there's three bucks on one doe they're not going to sit still very long and at any point they could push her up and over an, another ridge so we immediately went after those things you know if it was a different scenario earlier in the season and we would have bumped like a buck by himself or something we might have sat back and thought about it a little bit more but in this case it was like we got to get up there um, they're solely focused on that doe. We didn't, we didn't just spook four deer. We really just spooked one. And those three bucks have a, a, a lot of influence over where she's going because they're, they're constantly pushing her around. Sure. Yeah. Well, and like you said, I mean, if you didn't necessarily spook those bucks super hard, they've been chasing her. She's been running all day. Like it wasn't new for yeah. her to be running from them. You know what I mean? So I find that super interesting. What what about like, you know, you said it took you a couple hours to go like four or 500 yards. So you guys weren't, you know, sprinting over there. Like, what did that look like? Were you guys just still hunting mostly? Or I feel like oftentimes in the whitetail woods, um, in country that you describe, people think like, oh, I'm not going to use my binoculars that much. Like, how much were you guys glassing as you moved through there? Oh, the whole time. Um you know, you're stopping every 20 or 30 yards in glass. And, but the thing with a situation like this, where you have a series of ridges that are all about the same elevation, but um, it's not flat. You know, I mean, you, you've got peaks and valleys in there. So if, if we're still hunting flat terrain, we're going to move a heck of a lot slower and be glass and everything out in front of us. In this particular situation, we would we would get to the peak of one of those ridges and we would glass hard into the, the drainage below us and the opposite face and the opposite ridge for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We might even, we might even call a little bit to see if we could get something stirred up over there. And all we're looking for is movement. And I'm talking like just basically our heads popping up over top of the ridge, not our whole body. And once we clear all that section, then we make a very deliberate move down and through and then back up again. And while we're doing that, we're not glassing. We're not really even still hunting. We're walking a pretty good pace trying to get through that drainage and back up the ridge because we've been staring at that area the entire time. I mean, we've basically been trying. We've, we've cleared it. You kind of walk through it with your eyes. Right. Yep. We've cleared it. So it's like, okay, now we've got to get to the next position where we can see. Yep. I really like that point that you made about um, being discreet when you come over the top because you never know when the next ridge, that big buck's going to be right there. You yeah. know, I mean, he could be 20 yeah. yards, he could be on the other side, whatever, and, and not, you know, and, and like you said, being discreet and careful coming over the top, not exposing yourself. I mean, you might pop your head over and huck your pack down and need to shoot, you yeah. know, versus being like, oh, well, he was there. Now, now we got to go try and find him again. Yeah. Yeah, and, and more maybe kind of talk a little bit about um, 
you know, anything specific from a cover standpoint? Is there was there like a certain vegetation or certain? I know you talked about like he got he pushed that doe out of some mountain laurel, but you know you're looking at a big chunk of big timber with hardwood ridges rolling off a main ridge. Is there anything specific that you're looking at to try to you know dissect that further? Um, yeah, mountain laurel is a big one in that particular setting. Uh, also like big rock outcroppings up at the top. I mean, those whitetails will bed in the mountains, just like mule deer will out West, except there's nothing but trees out East, you know, in those mountains, um, they'll bed up in those rock outcroppings. Also, there's some clear cuts and whatnot mixed throughout, depending on the age of those clear cuts, they could be pretty thick and offer really good bedding cover. But the, the cover standpoint doesn't just work for the deer in that type of environment. Like you were just saying a second ago, Marco, where we're, where we're clearing those ridges and we're doing it carefully, we're not just going up in a random spot and poking our head over them. We're, we're picking a tree or a root wad or a brush pile like 80 yards in front of us. And then we're basically sneaking up to that thing and looking around it. That way we've got some cover in basically in between us and the oncoming deer that are just over the ridge and that's what eventually what what led us to killing the thing it's like that's how we were able to get in position to kill him is there was a big root wad there that we could see from below the lip of the ridge you know it was on the cap and we basically put that root wad in between us and the deer and we snuck, we crawled right to it and then i peeked around the side of the root wad and he was standing there at 75 yards and we were making noise but and it was a calm morning, but you got to remember these deer are rutting. They're on a hot dough and they're constantly making noise. They're on the lookout for another buck that's coming in on their trail. So they're looking up there at us, but they can't see us. We just sound like a deer or a squirrel or something ruffling in the leaves. So sorry, that was kind of in a, down the rabbit hole there. But no, no, I, no, I like it. I mean, I'll even yeah. circle back to those rock outcroppings. Um, heck, we'll see that sometimes here in Wisconsin too, yeah, you know, yep. depend, depending on where you're at. Are you finding that those deer are bedding like, you know, on top of the rock outcropping on the ridge or are they kind of have it like, like to their back? Like are they at the, are they at the bottom base of it? Cause I've seen, right. like, you know, mule deer bed, I guess probably both places, I guess. Yeah. But like oftentimes they're kind of like, you know, at the base, base of, it, of the rock with the know? rock at their back. Yeah. yeah. Depends on the best escape route for that situation. If it's a sheer bluff, they won't just go right out on the point of it very often because they can't hop off of it. You know, they're going to, they're dead if they do that, you know, but if they're, if, if there's a point with the, with a rock outcropping, however, there's, there's a few steep trails that, that bail off the side of it right there. Then they'll sit right there. You know, I mean, if it's a, if it's a steep rock bluff, um, but then it benches out right underneath it. They may bed right there on that bench, right up against those rocks, like what you're talking about. And then they can escape different directions, but that's pretty much what it comes down to is where is how good is their escape routes out of that particular bedding area. Yeah. Yep. Had you guys, I was kind of almost wondering like what your next step would have been. Like, let's say you, you know, you go four or five, six ridges over and you're like, man, like we didn't, we didn't find them. We didn't, we didn't relocate them. Is that something where you might go back to where you first saw him and be like, you know what? He liked being here for some reason. That doe came through here for some reason. Maybe he'll chase her back through. Maybe he'll lose her and come cruising back through that same spot. Like what would your next step have been had you not found him and killed him? We were basically going to comb through that whole section until we, until we either killed him or spooked it. Okay. Because, because of this scenario, he had a hot doe in there. We have no idea if that buck is a homebody in there, if he's from somewhere else. And I mean, this is Georgia there in public land. There's not, there's not a lot of these things running around. So it was like, you know, if he's here just for today on that hot doe or they're in this section just for today, we have to, we have to be super, super aggressive. You know, if that's back home in an area that I hunt often, then I, I might take a step back and be like, okay, I'm going to let him have his space today and I'm going to wait for different conditions um, or a different time to come in here and kill him. You know, if it, but under that, in, in that particular situation, to answer your question, that's what we were doing is we were going to pop those ridges until we bumped them. 
And we were not trying to bump them. We were trying to get eyes on them before we spooked them. And that's ultimately what we ended up doing. But worst come to worst, we were going to comb through all those woods until we ran into them. Yeah. And then as, Warb, as far as like, uh, you know, if you're picturing that, that big, uh, conjecture of ridges is like a hand, right? You know, as the, as the, as, you, as those finger ridges get closer to that main ridge, obviously your valley between them is a little less steep than it would be when they're way out on the points. Were you guys looking closer to the heads of those ditches or were they, was, were you thinking he was going to be more towards a point? They're kind of right on the center. Like yeah. if you're thinking of the ridge, like your finger, they were right there on the middle knuckle, essentially. Yeah. But they, they laid out exactly like you're saying, Rick. I mean, they're the higher up that you go, the the less uh, terrain, the less steep that you're you're having to deal with. So, I mean, we we tried to kind of split the difference because if we went too high, then we didn't have enough to keep us hidden from deer that were bedded down towards the points of those ridges or in the ditches. But if we went down too low, then we're looking up the entire time into that mountain laurel and stuff like that on those upper benches. And those deer basically have you pinned at that point. Yeah. I was going to say so, that does, that definitely sounds like a balancing act of, you know, staying hidden, yeah. but also maintaining like your elevation advantage from, you know, from the deer to get the shot that you need. The good thing was, is we got a good line of travel when they boogered and they, that we watched them go over the top of that ridge. And then we could actually see in the leaves because there were so many deer chasing that doe. We could see where the leaves were turned up, where they, where they had ran through a couple of those drainages. And that took a little bit of detective work, you know, looking around and, and slowing down a little bit and paying attention to that. But we basically followed that and just kept going up and over, clearing it and then up and over again with, with that intention of, of basically looking right along that same elevation line within two or 300 yards. Yeah. That's super cool. That's, that's why I asked that is like, I'm trying to put myself in that position and like, I, you know, I, so many times I feel like it's the easier line of travel to lose that terrain and get up more towards the heads of those ditches. You're not hiking as much, but to your point, you know, if you're more in the, in the center of it, you're going to be hiking a little bit more, but I, that's where the deer want to be is that mid uh, to end section of those ridges. Yeah. And your head, when you pop over that ridge, you're dropping back down in elevation. And then you're, you're coming up and you're, you're coming up a sharper face at that point where you can peer over the top. Um, if we were just setting up though, we might go towards the top of those fingers, like what you're talking about. Yeah. Sure. Sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep. If you're just going to go sit it out for a little bit or something. For sure. Yeah. Yep. Man, I like it. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it was an exciting hunt. It was a cool hunt. Like I said, you can kind of yep. watch you can watch the whole thing play out on your YouTube channel. If you want the uh, the condensed version, check out the Vortex YouTube channel. Yep. But, like, uh, just a cool hunt, lessons learned. And I think, uh, you know, hunts like this and having you break it down, I mean, that's – you can talk all day, all day long, but being able to watch it and hear about it, yeah. you know, you can, you can really learn a lot. Totally. Yeah, I got really lucky. <laughs> really, really really lucky but it was awesome huh? and and then there's always that part yeah it's a ridiculously huge buck for georgia too like for anyone that hasn't seen the video like i remember watching it the first time being like holy crap i can't believe they found that thing i mean that's like a big one for anywhere oh yeah 100%. you know like i mean just just yeah just a true monarch of the woods yeah <laughs> i'm still wondering i mean I, uh, I'm still scratching my head. I don't, cause I haven't been able to figure out how to get a deer to stick around for a second shot with the muzzle loader. <laughs> so maybe, a, maybe, <laughs> maybe some tips on that. <laughs> yeah. It's blind luck. I mean, complete, complete blind luck in that particular it's instance. Unreal. That thing was so preoccupied with that doe, you know, and, and luckily we had that root wad to hide behind. So when I blew the first shot, <laughs> I mean, the smoke cleared and the thing just literally standing there because the doe didn't leave. Um, and I just rolled in behind that root wad and just re reloaded as quickly as I possibly could and got back on him. And, and I, I had a much better, much more open opportunity the second shot than I did on the first one. I rushed it on the first one just because it was a big buck and I, I got nervous and we were in a, in such a close position to him that, I'm like, man, at any moment they can take up, take off up out of here and we're going to be toast. So I rushed it and I shot over him. I'm pretty sure the second one nailed him. 
I, I tell you what, though, I mean, I mean, there's two lessons of, hey, it's not over till it's over. No, you right. spook them, you shoot, whatever. It's not over, so stay in the game. Try and keep your composure, yeah, which for is sure. not always easy. And, uh, man, it just it worked out this time. And, like I said, just cool hunt, big buck, lots of lessons, yep. and uh, fun to watch. So appreciate you uh, putting that together and, and sharing it with us, Aaron, and, and recapping it because uh, I'm going to take these tips of the woods here and – couple weeks no doubt heck yeah dude happy to do it awesome man well, well thanks good. man thanks and uh good luck in uh, in kansas where you're at right now go get them and uh, we'll look forward to the next story what is up everybody mark on the mic here eric barber to my right and mr zach from thp across from us welcome everybody to our post hunt breakdown so this is this is again once again, part of our, our, our uh, post-hunt breakdown series is a compilation of hunts. Zach, you put together a really killer edit where you kill a really nice buck. You're hunting whitetails, out west, river bottom, spot and stock type stuff. So uh, before I just keep rambling, as I like to do, <laughs> as, as we did collectively before uh, we're actually recording our real podcast, yeah. which we, I think we recorded like two other podcasts in the process. Uh, Zach, number one, welcome. Number two... What's uh? Give us uh, give us the uh, the story of this hunt. I know you you can watch it on our YouTube page, yeah. which I you're gonna want to do. Click the link in the description. We've got a link to it down there. Yep, so exactly. You can go find it. And uh, but we're gonna kind of fill in fill in with all the details here. So what's yeah. uh, what's going on? It looked like just super exciting hunt, Zach. Oh, this is one of my favorites ever, and I appreciate you guys having me. I'm excited to to continue the the fun conversation, but. Um, yeah, I guess the details of that um, it was a new area, only had ever scouted it on a map. And, you know, I up to this point had started to kind of get some experience hunting other Western, you know, whitetail areas and was starting to kind of recognize that uh, a few things that I wanted to target, but also just like strategy within that. So like I've become more and more at this point and especially now even a couple of years later like really dependent on glassing which um is kind of like factored into the strategy going in and to start though i wanted to find places that i felt like there were deer but i could also get up on a high point and really be able to see a lot and have options to you know maybe move around within those high points and just check different spots. So before we even left on that hunt, I had spent a crazy amount of time looking at maps. And the number one thing I was doing is I was going on on X, flipping on the topo layer. And now I think, and, and these days they've actually switched it. So you can see this even on the hybrid layer, but there's two forms of stream you know, on the map, there's the dotted blue, which is intermittent stream. And then there's solid blue. And to kind of confirm that, then I would go back to the hybrid and just like zoom all the way in to see if I could actually see, you know, consistent water throughout this channel. And what I was doing is pinning those areas. And then once I found those areas, I'm looking at the topo to see where you know, I can get an angle to look down into these water sources. So permanent water is what we always say, or like a, a permanent stream versus an intermittent stream. Those intermittent streams, you know, obviously on a wet year could be good, but generally out West at the end of summer, early September, beginning of fall, things are pretty dry. So it was pretty much just looking for small creeks that had water or bigger rivers that had water all year. The rivers are a little bit easier to tell, but, um, you know, some of those creeks were places we were pinning too. And we really didn't anticipate a lot of hunting pressure. So I wouldn't necessarily say that I was trying to find places that were super hard to access right out of the gate. I was kind of just thinking like, well, we'll just get there, kind of feel it out, you know, maybe drive around. And, and that's kind of the next step. Like once you get there, kind of just go to those places and like check them either cross them off or, you know, say, Hey, this is going in the list of places we're going to probably revisit and keep, keep checking out. And there was a couple small creeks that we saw that had water that we were interested in. And there was some kind of ag around some of those. And then 
Um, there was a couple of places along the bigger river as well that we found some green food sources and, and actually ended up finding some places that were harder to get back into. It took a couple of miles to walk to some of these glassing points. And, and again, this is, this is, this is really important. Like to me is pinning those exact spots where I can get up on a knob and really see a whole lot left, right, you know, back, or maybe I can walk down a ridge or whatever and just keep getting different angles. And we pinned, um, I don't know, I think we had like three main target areas, two on a bigger river, one on a smaller Creek. And we spent the first day looking at the smaller Creek and, um, one of the, and we actually saw a nice buck in that, um, evening on that smaller Creek. But the problem was, is they were making it back into thicker cover to where we couldn't really keep eyes on them as much as we wanted to. So like we saw them the night before and the next morning we didn't see them. We saw other deer, but we didn't see that bigger buck. And it's like, well, he's probably in that patch of timber. Like, and as far as our glassing strategy goes, like it's going to just, I mean, we're basically waiting for him to come out at last light. So we kind of reset, refocused back on some of these river spots where we could have a little bit more of an open uh, area. We could just see a little bit more. And Jake and I, I, I were honestly kind of like eh, feeling a little discouraged, like thinking maybe we would even pick up and drive, you know, a couple hours to get to some different stuff. And because also side note, people everywhere like freaking me out kind of because i was like didn't expect that going into it but there's people everywhere there's residents there's non-residents and every time you see a non-resident you pretty much assume that you know they're they're doing the same thing you are looking for white tails and in, in the wet areas so we end up um going back to a spot on the river walking in a good ways and sat down and threw up the spotter and within like a few minutes could see bucks milling around within a little bedding area right up against the water out west it's like there's a lot of times on these river bottoms there's like a band of uh, i'm sure eric you've seen it like out out west as well uh, mark probably as well like there's that little band of like willowy like thick really high stem count stuff right on like a bend of the river it's almost like where the water hit, hits some years and uh they were just milling around in there and they'd kind of bed stand back up whatever and we made a, a run down on one of the eight pointers he was in velvet and we watched him bed but by the time we made it down there which was kind of challenging um it took longer than what we thought to cross the river or get off the face of the hill we were on across the river he was gone so we figured we didn't spook him we never really heard any sign of spooking deer so we Figured the next morning we'd just come back, get up on that same high point, just keep glass, and then get up there the next morning. And now it's me, Jake, Greg, and Gooch. And we're watching that same bottom pretty much right away, glass up those same three bucks. There's a little uh like a non-typical looking thing that was shedding his velvet. There's eight pointer in velvet, and then there was another small buck that uh I really don't remember what he looks like, but I remember it was the same three I pretty much glassed them right up They're like oh that's sweet like let's just play this patient and and we're gonna try to let them bed in a good spot where we can make an effective move and i think that's like a really good side note of this story is when you're glassing things and you know that you're not going to lose that visual on them completely i think it's important to to let them get into a vulnerable spot where you can plan a route from your glassing spot or start a route plan and then continue to like revise that as you move in. And the problem was that morning was they got super buried in that bedding area that they were in. And we never really saw exactly where they bedded. And we were hopeful all morning. It's like, it's looking like they're going to just plop down at any point. And right at the last second, they just like dive deep into that stuff. And it's like, well, we've got an entire day. We know they're in there. We haven't seen any hunters or any sign of hunters in this area. Let's just chill and just, you know, keep eyes on them and let them do, let, let them essentially make a mistake to where we've got a good angle on them. Um, it's also important to note that the wind was super consistent, moving like straight up and down the river bottom. So we know we 
we've got a consistent wind. Steep hills going into the river bottom that could have created some swirling, but like on that particular day, baby, it was coming right down the pipe. It was just beautiful. <laughs> and uh, impatient me, I'm sitting there for too long, and I'm like, dude, I can't just keep sitting here. It's been like three hours. Like I gotta like, I gotta go, you know, do something because squirrel brain Zach over there. I just like pick up and I just grab my spotter and I grab my binos. That actually just like left my bow back there. Cause I'm just like, if I go over here and I see one, you know, I'm going to want to chase him. So I sit there or I start sneaking down the ridge and I'm just trying to look originally to look at those bucks from a different angle to maybe get eyes into that bedding area. I also don't feel like I'm going to affect anything because I'm so far away from them. And, you know, along the way I start kind of getting that feeling of like, Jake and I almost call it like a spooky, like you're in, in the spot that he doesn't want you to be, isn't he, he being the, the big one, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like start getting that, like, Ooh, something feels weird over here. Like he might, like something might happen. I remember seeing a little group of pronghorn and I hadn't been seeing pronghorn. It's just like, man, they're really tucked away down in here to a place where they can't, you, you know, people aren't bothering them. And I'm like, yeah, like that feeling continues. And keep working down the ridge and eventually get to a point where there's this really steep drop off. And I know that if I peek over that, I'm going to get eyes on a little bit more country and I peek over it and like straight down below. I mean, it, it, like a, a probably hundred feet, 200 feet, probably 200 feet below. I see a buck standing down there with his head up feeding on stuff. And immediately it's like, that's the big one. Like that's, like he's alone doing something different than all these other bucks. And I didn't anticipate that when I got up to move, but you know, as I started moving and getting that feeling, I thought there was a real possibility. So I freak out, get those guys. I get those guys and we get to where we can, we're all sitting there on that high point looking down there. And at this point he's now bedded. So like, I didn't exactly watch him bed down because I was freaking out, like getting them freaking out, just, you know, wigging myself out really. And I'm not wigging myself out, but I was getting super fired up. Like, yeah. and that meant my mentality switch to like, I'm going to put myself through anything physically that I have to, to kill this buck. And like, it, it was pretty fun to have that mentality. Like when I get that, it usually is good and I don't always get it. And sometimes I get sloppy. Like you almost have to like turn your brain off and like go into that. Like I'm going to go get painful here. Like I'm going to crawl through whatever it takes. So Jake and I get pretty fired up and we snap some photos of the lay of the land there. Like obviously we're able to keep eyes on it the whole time. But when you switch from being up, you know, on a cliff looking down into that bottom, things change so much that you lose that perspective. Yeah. And your brain can't always comprehend like what exactly you're looking at compared to what you were looking at yeah. up there. And, and Zach, but, you shot those photos on your phone, right? Just so you yeah. had them right there. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure people knew that like, that's something you guys are just shooting on your phone. Yeah. So you can reference just like snapping a photo. Yep. And then like another thing that I'll do sometimes if it's hard just to see, generally I can remember, but you can go in and you can do like, edit and then like markup yep and if you mark up it'll allow you to like draw on it so like sometimes i'll circle and even other times like scouting for example i'll take a picture of a place just to remember exactly where i saw deer i'll just do that little markup and just write a circle on even if i revisit it like five years from now i'll have that i'll remember exactly where they are and then you do that paired with pinning stuff on your map and you should have a pretty pretty solid idea so yeah yeah we decide that to get the wind perfectly in our favor, we kind of got to drop off to the left. We stay tucked behind terrain to drop off the, the cliff that we're on. And then we get down on his level. And now the wind's blasting straight from him to us. And everything looks the same that he's in. He's in a patch of cottonwoods and they're all the same size. And they're all, I mean, they're all just so uniform. It's incredible. They're not real close together they're probably 
you know, they're all spaced out exactly the same. It's just it's kind of eerie how similar everything looked once you're down in there. And we had to crawl from one patch of timber to the patch of timber that he was in. There was a little bit of an opening. And, um, we just stayed low. It was one of these deals where had we just walked there, we probably could have got away with it, but there was always that risk that if he stands up, he's going to nail us. It's, you know, it's, it's that, it's that specific. So we crawl, get into the patch of timber with him. And then it's like, man, like, I don't know where he is. Cause like, once you're down there, you realize that what he is in is just tall enough that it's like probably at the line of his back and his head sticks up and over it. But when we were up high, it looked like you could see his whole body easy and you just assume that you'd be able to see him bedded. Well, that's not true. He's bedded now and stuff that's like above his antlers. So we're crawling, crawling, moving in and uh, <laughs> got to a point where it was like, you're looking at that photo and you're like, I think that's the dead tree that is on this photo. And you're kind of lining all those things up and you're taking like any little abnormality in this cottonwood patch and you're relating it to what you're seeing in the photo and what you're seeing on the ground. We eventually get to a point where it's like, okay, he's either right here at 30 yards or he's right here at 22 yards. And because we didn't know exactly which tree, there was two trees that looked exactly like what he's bedded under. And, and those are the two spots. So to get closer, we start cutting the distance between those two trees. We just kind of, you know, wind's still in our favor coming this way, generally speaking. So we just kind of split those two, tr two trees. And as we're closing in, we look up at Gooch and he's kind of given us like the, he's given us like 30 yards. So it's like, okay, like we are right. We're right here. And could he still see the buck? Mm -hmm. Okay. He could see the buck and he could see us which is just insane. I mean, that's what makes, that's what makes the whole thing like pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Is there's, you know, two different perspectives completely. Yeah. And, uh, we are feeling confident that he's here, but we don't know which exact spot. So this is important. We're close enough now that it's like, I can't get caught off guard. So I knock an arrow. I don't know exactly which spot he's at, but I've knocked that arrow and I'm kind of up glass and, kind of on my knees hunched over just to where I can keep my eyes just over that brushy stuff that we're in. And I'm glassing to the left, to that tree to the left that I think is an option. And I slowly look back over to the right and I see him standing there and he's up and he's looking around and I'm like, I don't know, like, I'm like he's right here. He's right here. And he's close. And Jake's up, Jake gets up filming him. And when he does that, it, it, the buck pretty much immediately, not immediately, but within a few seconds, saw Jake sitting up like that. But Jake didn't move. He's just up enough to where he's got that camera over the brush and the buck snaps at him and is looking right at him. And that's where like the classic, the classic scene of him looking right down at us and he starts kind of walking towards us and he knows something's up. and. Um, we end up like just kind of hanging loose there, waiting and staying patient. And I think I drew a time or two, even like trying to decide if I wanted to try to pop up, but the buck can't see me. I'm only looking at his antler tips over the, the brush line. And I think that's really important in these situations. You know, generally most folks aren't going to have uh, a Jake sitting up filming, you know, keeping the buck's curiosity, but J because Jake didn't move, we got away with it. And he's sitting there filming him and I'm drawing, staying low. And eventually he gets to a point where I draw again and I realize he's starting to turn because I'm watching his antlers and you can read all his body language just by seeing his antlers, you know, and he turns and it gives me just enough of like the side eye that I can tell that just based off the way his antlers are turned, he probably can just barely catch me out of his, you know, periphery, our left yeah. peripheral, you know, and it, Jake goes, you know, pop up because we're thinking the same exact thing. And as he's saying that I go up, Jake kind of goes up and he's, he's super close. So it was, it was uh, not hard to necessarily settle that pin, you know, versus like 
something that's even out to like 25, 30, you're going to really want to settle that pin. I basically just get up, get it on him and wham, I shot and fast and just pushed it right through that, <laughs> through that little brush. Actually, it's, it's pretty cool. There's been a couple bucks I've shot where I'm, I know I'm close enough that I can get away with it. Mm-hmm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't promote this if like, depending on what your arrow setup is, like if you're shooting a mechanical broadhead with a light, lighter arrow, I wouldn't do this, but like I basically just shoot straight through that brush, knowing that I'm going to punch through it. And I'm, I'm, I know I'm aiming at his heart, but I'm actually aiming at just brush. Like I'm using the top of his back line, and just punching it straight through that stuff. And I, you know, once I got the pin on him, I knew it was, it was going to be, it was good. And I let her go and bam, hit him. And he really only ran probably like 40 yards and, and went right down and, I mean, we completely lost our minds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ever, but, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, the kind of the things that always pop back into my mind when I think of, of this hunt, I guess, to kind of like recap is like water is, is key, you know, yeah. always, you know, even if you're in Pennsylvania, it's like having some sort of water source that's permanent close enough to where the the bedding area is, it's going to be important for them being there throughout the season. So it's always just a great starting point. Um, but then especially like, you know, in a, in a Western drier, arid climate setting. And then, um, that's number one. Number two is picking glassing spots, but then also be willing to move within the glassing spots. And, and I, I do love talking about that and, and listening to other people's opinions because there's so many ways to glass, you know, like you can get down to the nitty gritty and try to pick out a time, you know, you can also just kind of move and kind of look on a broader scale. And in this situation, I was just because my impatience got the best of me, I was able to spot this buck. Had I not had a little bit of that impatience and just wanted to move around a little bit, I, I would have never saw him. And I think like not getting caught in cement in your glassing spot is mm-hmm. kind of like a little, a little, uh, side note of that and I'd, 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 oh no go ahead I was, I was gonna say i think you know you can call it complacent or um impatience you know but i think you can be complacent too you're like yeah ah, you know i'm in a good spot i can see pretty much everything yeah. um and you can be a little bit lazy because you can see a lot but like you said just a little even sometimes just like a little bit of a change yeah 20 yards makes a big difference mm-hmm. you know I, I'd, I'd be curious too when you finally did spot that buck when you were even like uh, up higher was he just in one of those spots where you had to just get low to see over that final thing to be able to see him yeah like he so he was so tucked up against that that cliff that i couldn't necessarily which i think was part of his defense in a, in a way sure, like mm-hmm. i think he could get up and over it uh, i think he could escape from 360 degrees but like i think part of the reason he was there is because the wind was coming right along that edge and he knew nothing was coming straight over that cliff. So, I mean, you had to basically get right to where I saw him from to see him. You wouldn't have been able to see him really anywhere else other than right there because of how tight to it he was. You know, it's almost like it's almost like he was underneath of it in a way, you know right. what I mean? Up under. Yeah. And by dropping that elevation, you were able to expose more of that bottom than had mm-hmm. you s- sat up on top. Yeah, like, and once I got out on that ridge, like, what you don't ever see in the video is how much more I can actually see to the right, too, which is where a side, a little side channel creek came into the main, you know, sure. main bottom. So I could really see so much more once I started walking out there. And I remember that, you know, that's kind of what was making me think, like, who knows what's going to happen here if I, I keep going. And then the final thing was, is just like really making a solid plan with using the photos and then picking a route that just was going to put the wind in our favor. I mean, sometimes something that I guess I over overlook in, in talking about strategy is, is, is wind, you know, it's always, it's always going through my mind in the moment. Um, but because the wind was blasting so hard down that river bottom, you know, you, you can keep, you can, you know, you can keep the wind in your favor. And also when you're glassing, so this is another like maybe oddball, like strategy note. When I'm glassing, 
a buck that I want to pursue, I'm not only glassing him and his position, I'm also glassing the route, but I'm also glassing vegetation to know how, if the vegetation's all laid over this way and doing that, well, then I can assume the wind's blowing from here to here, right? I'm looking at how vegetation is being affected by wind downrange because where it is of hitting me up on top may be different than it is down there. And a lot of times you can even see swirl if you're glassing that vegetation. You can see leaves come off of a tree like, you know, in October, November, it's super easy to see it when the leaves are falling off the tree. So that is super important. That's something that I know Jake and I have started doing a lot more is like not just glassing the buck, but glassing like the whole scene to the point where you're looking at wind direction downrange without even having to drop milkweed or, you know, a, a puff bottle or whatever. It's like you can just look at that vegetation and get a pretty good gauge on what it's doing. And then the photo, man, like that, that really, really helped us because we were able to you know, take these little landmarks and just say, hey, right here it is on the photo. Here's where he is in relation to that landmark. Here's where we are now that we're down here. And it's, it's been super helpful. And it, like, it's been so helpful that, like, I do it every time that I'm moving in on something that I've glassed now. Like, it, it's really, really important, I think. So do you shoot like a handful of pictures, like even like, you know, oh, yeah. a wide and then like, okay, now I'm going to zoom in just to get some of those more detail type stuff you're like you know you're describing like okay this log looks like that like okay so we're by that log do you, you shoot a variety of pictures then i do i do shoot uh, i'll shoot a wide i'll shoot a, a zoomed in sometimes i'll like zoom it in to where it's like even really bad quality just so i can see the fine like yeah to the point where like you're looking for that branch that you know is broken you know three quarters of the way up so you can see those super super fine details as you need because and another thing too um that i do a lot now is i'll go back and i'll reference like the phone scope or whatever the digi scope video that i have on my phone too of the bucks um in this particular hunt i didn't but like last year i was in uh, new mexico hunting mule deer and that's something i did a lot when i was looking at um at the photo, I would take the wide photos, but then I'd also look at that real specific video clip to where I'm looking at where he's bedded in relation to this bush, you know, and that's something that's helped a lot as well. Cause it just helps you get that, you know, additional detail, I suppose. And, um, even a video, like even a wide video, like you, you'd be amazed at how frustrated you can get at yourself be, because of not taking enough photos, like what you're saying, Mark. It's like sometimes I'm like, dude, I wish I would have taken more. Like I just snapped these lazily. And, and in that situation, I didn't. I took a bunch of them and we felt really good about it. Well, and like you guys were saying, you know, you, you think you think you're going to remember or you're or you think it's going to look the same and, and I you yeah. take three steps off the hill and it starts to look totally different. different and then like you said you get down in there and you're like is he 30 yards or 200 yards yeah yeah that, that's something too that like you know I mean even 10 years ago people weren't doing as much of you know because it was like the the cameras weren't as capable now everyone's got a phone in their pocket you know the cameras are are an awesome resource and just getting creative with how you can use that i think is going to help a lot mm -hmm. especially from like not only the landmarks but even planning the route you know like even like hey there's this little like dry creek drainage that comes in yeah i'm going to mark that up on the map you know using that markup feature that you're kind of talking about there plan that then on over on whatever you know mapping software you're using and it just kind of it's like that second point of like reassurance that yeah this is the right place and where i do need to go mm -hmm. so yeah one thing yeah one thing that i do a lot of is and my dad and i were just talking about this um yesterday is like i'll draw a lot of lines on my map as routes there's there's i mean so many different um benefits to that but like drawing that line to that pin in this situation where the buck was it's just like like you said it's just reassurance that you're on the right track it's also reassurance that you know like how far you are from him so i also just recently kind of feel like a fool for not knowing this but jake just recently showed me that on on x you can pin something and then hit go to waypoint and it'll draw you like as the crow flies line as to how far you are from something so um 
drawing those lines, using that, those little tools kind of just gives you an idea too. So for example, when we pinned where that buck was on, on our, on our, on X, we, we assume that we're probably within like, I mean, you'd hope we were within 30 yards of him, right? Cause you can see exactly where he is. You can do the little like compass tool to face right where he is. You can, you know, you should be able to get it pretty close. So when you're moving in and you have that go-to waypoint and it's saying 100 yards, 80 yards, 60 yards, you know, you're probably close to that. So that really helps a lot too. And I mean, you also like run the fine line. Like you don't want to be looking at your phone all the time when he stands up, but right. You know, and then, and then I guess the one last thing that I think is important is when you are in the danger zone, get the arrow on because had that buck stood up and, and I not had the arrow on, it would have been much harder to pull it off because I'd had to do so much more movement get my bow up and get the arrow on and it's the difference and, between spooking them and, and killing them at that point yep or just getting completely caught off guard and him coming in you know it's just and then i guess i guess there is one final one final play here and like this is something that shouldn't be shouldn't be overlooked or kicked to the side either is the the waiting for him to turn his head you know like there's been a couple bucks that i've shot that have nailed me one was this one and one was in New York. And there's this, there's this instinct that we have, I think that's like the panic instinct to just like, I got to get drawn. I got, I got to do it because he's got me. And I remember on both of those situations, feeling tempted to draw and make those movements. But it's like, when he's locked on like that, if you move at all, it's over because right, you're now, exactly. you've now went from what is that log or what is that new abnormal thing there? That's not moving. You know, he can't make out exactly what it is where we're in camo or whatever. You're, you're, you're still kind of sitting in the brush, but he can see something. But if all of a sudden that makes a big move, like a draw, well, that triggers, triggers the fear, right? So when watching antlers, you can tell like where his eyes can see and as soon as he started to turn his head and give that window to where you know his only like maybe only the very edge of his vision on his left eye could see us that was the opportunity and it's just it takes like an extra step of patience and also like not letting it's super hard to do and um you almost have to just like accept the fact that odds are low that you're going to get away with it in general, but the only way you are going to get away with it is if you're patient. So you just have to kind of like, you almost have to like, uh, I don't even know how to, what, what I'm trying to say with that, but it's like, just stay calm, stay relaxed. No, it's not over until it's over, over. Like you got to just give it a minute and you never know. He might turn that head completely. And like in the New York situation, I ended up shooting the buck. He had already nailed me but he was worried about his doe. I shot him straight up standing all the way up. I was, I mean, had he been looking at me, there's no way he would have saw me, but he was looking completely the other way. Like his, his rack was like this. So like, I knew as soon as he turned, it's like, I got all the time in the world. And I just stood up and made it, made a pretty routine shot. So it's like, same thing with this. It's like, he was close enough that when I knew I got up that I had the time and, and, I think that's just really important as yeah. well. And it's hard to do, but it, yeah, it's definitely, it it's definitely one of those things that like people need to see this thing to believe it, you know, really understand. <laughs> so, you know, definitely go to the YouTube channel, check it out there. You know, this is kind of the more, uh, the X's and O's of how it all came together. But if you want to see this thing in practice, go over to the YouTube channel where you can watch it along with the rest of the hunts that we got on this, this episode. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, it really will tie everything together. And, you know, it's always just good watching a good hunting video, too. <laughs> no doubt, Marco. Uh, one of my favorite parts of that video is when I have my, my wireless mics on and I start to make the pursuit. And I let out this like super deep breath. And I like, I felt like in that moment, it just was in my mind, that was the locked in moment. And like, I kind of just like, I don't know. It's like, it's game time. Everything yeah. else in the world is, is irrelevant. 
go get him. Yep. Like, shut your brain off. If, you're, if your knees hurt because you're on pokey stuff or your hands hurt, it's like you got to just fight through it. And I, that, that, that moment in real life and in the video is always just a great reminder of like the lock in. Yeah, I, definitely. I man. really like that. I really like that silly little part of that video. Yeah. You can do that. <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> yeah, man. I well, dig it. I think that that's probably the, the final tip. Uh, it's not going to hurt to be an absolute wolf in the woods. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you've got that mastered, uh, you ought to be able to kill some deer as well. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, shit. Well, we appreciate it, man. Again, for anyone listening, go over to the YouTube video, watch a full one there, and uh, we'll see you on the next one. Catch you on the next one. Thanks, Zach. What is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here, Mr. Michael Hunsucker from Heartland Bowhunter across from me right now. Mike, they say uh, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I guess a cool deer hunt video is at least worth 10,000 words. So we're going to try and crank out a few words talking about a sweet deer hunt that you guys, uh, well, you videoed it, videoed it for the show. And then you created like this uh, consolidated version that is going to be a uh, part of our, you know, our compilation of videos. And uh, I have to say, I watched it, and you know that part of um, of the great outdoors when John Candy's like, he's like, big bear, big, 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 big bear. That's what I, like, like I was doing that, but I was like, big buck, big buck, big buck. <laughs> Dude, that was a cool hunt and a really big deer. Oh, uh, yeah. I felt like my son when he was like two years old, his first words were like, big buck, big buck, big buck on the wall. <laughs> That's all I could say. I was like, uh, 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 big buck. There's a big buck right there. Uh, no, man, it was nuts. Um, Colorado, man, special place out there. Just eastern Colorado and the eastern plains. It's more like kind of western Kansas, as you would think, for like whitetail wise, river bottom country. And just, I don't know what it is, um, but whatever they're doing as far as, you know, management wise from a, from a state standpoint, they're doing it right. Um, limited tags and um, just the age structure out there is insane. I mean, just, I think a lot of it has to do with the, you know, the, the, pressure being you know somewhat limited but also then just the actual habitat for the deer is just picture perfect tons of cover for them to hide and they can get old what um so you answered one of my first questions because i I was watching the video i was like that don't look like missouri to me number one i know you guys hunt all over but i was like that was i was like god where are those guys at because it did look like you know pretty unique really cool whitetail habitat um go into like what what do you think it is about that habitat that's like, you know, they're getting old or, or that they like there or whatever? Like, what, what were you seeing from, like, uh, you know, what, what kind of trees were there? What was the water like? You know, you guys were on some water, like, uh, which we'll get into that a little bit. But what was going on there from, from that standpoint? Yeah, so it's river bottom country. Um, and it's amazing out there, that area. It, it, that The river is the lifeblood of the area. Like, it is a desolate desert nasty place and you drop off just slightly into this little river bottom and everything changes it's all creek uh creek bottoms with giant cottonwood trees and then they have what's called tamaracks tamarack bushes which are um would be like a scrubby bush that gets probably seven eight feet tall but just incredible cover and it's i don't know much about it honestly i, I would assume it's pretty invasive um just by judging on the, like the the way it looks and the way it grows and um, you know, so it's, it, it's, it's probably an invasive, uh, uh, type of bush, but it's incredible cover for deer. And I've shed hunted a lot of that. We turkey hunt out there too in the spring and spend a lot of time shed hunting that stuff. And it is a bear to walk through and you could, you could walk through, pick through a, I don't know, 20 acre area of tamarack bushes and to feel like you're shed hunting in like 300 acres. Like it's just, you just can't cover it all. Um, so from a whitetail standpoint, man, it just gives them, it gives them cover and gives them the ability to hide and not you know even with a rifle you know what i mean you can't really gain any advantage it's so thick in there so i think that's part of the reason it just gives them some some really really good cover for them to, to hide when the pressure's high that's awesome what about from uh, from a food perspective um outside of the river is there like kind of egg on top then or what's going on there yeah so there's no there's no egg on top and there really isn't much of a top and bottom i mean it's pretty it's pretty uh you know, even, or, you know, slight slope around the, the river areas, but a um, lot of, a uh, lot of irrigated fields. And so what's crazy is there's like, there's so much that goes on with that water that there's each property and each place has water rights for certain things, for wells, for there's, you know, the county might own some wells, the uh, cattle 
cattle feed operation that is like three miles away, five, seven, eight miles away, might own some of the rights and they're pumping water eight miles. And so like every ounce of water that comes out of that river is accounted for and somebody, you know, has a say so in it, um, whether it's the 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 uh, city of Colorado Springs or the state of Kansas, like if you're taking water from it, they know about it. So it's pretty, <laughs> it's pretty, that's how important it is. I mean, literally that's how important it is in that area. So, um, so that being said, yes, there are some uh, crops. Um, there are some corn, soybeans, uh, not a lot of soybeans actually, come to think about it, but uh, corn, um, triticale and winter wheat, that type of stuff. Um, so they have flood irrigated fields, they have pivot irrigated fields, but so there, there's definitely plenty of food along the river system, plenty of cover, and then obviously water. Um, so the, the whitetails do not venture far from the, from the river. That's for sure. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, food, water, cover, you know what I mean? Like that's, uh, that's all the things. And it sounds like they've uh, got those things in spades right there. What, so walk us through like, and you did in the video, but like walk us through, you know, the background of that hunt and what transpired. Yeah. So we, um, like I mentioned in the video, we were aware of this buck, um, and being that, you know, my time is fairly limited out there. Usually I spend, you know, at least a week in late October, they have a unique, um, rifle season that opens up usually right around the end of October, the beginning of November. And you can archery hunt during the rifle season if you have a, a rifle tag, but being that I'm a non-resident, I have to put in a draw for a tag. And so I drew a archery tag only. So, um, I usually focus on that last week of archery season before rifle opens up. And then if I am not successful, I usually plan to come back right as uh, rifle closes on the backside. So around November, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth, whatever it might be. So, um, last year, actually I was, um, uh, went there, hunted that last week of October, had a good hunt. Um, the deer weren't quite ready. They just weren't rutting. The, there wasn't much period activity. We weren't seeing a ton and you never really know. It kind of, you know, varies year to year. So, but we had several really good bucks on camera and being that my time is limited. Um, I usually don't key out one buck, especially during the rut. It's just, you'll drive yourself nuts. And so, you know, we had a list of a handful of bucks that we were really kind of focused on. We knew what areas, you know, those big mature deer, like they don't all hang out together. Right. So, I mean, like, you know, we knew, okay, this area this is where this buck likes to hang out and they, they all kind of have their own core carved out areas, even during the rut. Um, you know, they may venture to and from, but, uh, so we knew about the buck and we're aware of him, um, but we weren't necessarily focusing on him uh, entirely. And so that first week we hunted, um, that last week of October and just, yeah, I didn't see a whole lot of, of pre activity. Finally started getting going towards the end of that trip, of course, naturally, you know, like, right. And we're getting, we're getting num- our days are numbered. And so we were focusing on a triticale field, which is a green, basically winter wheat, winter wheat looking crop. And it was where the majority of the deer were concentrated. So we, our thoughts kind of were just like, let's just hunt where the does are. Um, if that's where the big group of does are, like the first one to come into heat's going to be here likely. So like the bucks were starting to get kind of antsy and, and, and hang out around that area. Um, had bucks uh, actually towards the end of that week, had a buck that we were hunting a big, big mature eight pointer. Literally had an encounter the night before. Uh, the next day we go in to hunt him and I check my trail camera that e- that evening and that morning in the middle of the night, he broke off his whole right side fighting in the middle of that triticale field. And so I was like, <clears throat> it's funny. I had a picture of him on a scrape. I think seven minutes or three minutes had a picture of him without the antler. So I, I knew in three minutes he lost that antler. And so we were joking around. We were like, we're shooting this deer. I don't care if he's got one side. I know that antler's in this field. And uh, of course, never, never did have, a, have an opportunity, but I was like, That'd be the one time I'd only shoot like a broken, full broken off one horn deer. I mean, whenever I hear a story like that, I'm always like, who, what deer did that to him? You know, like you yeah. start, like it just starts, starts going through your head. Like how big was the deer that can break a mean beam like that? You know, it's just like, it's almost, uh, it's almost dumbfounding. Um, you're going, you know, you were talking about like kind of knowing, you know, some of these different bucks are being aware of these different bucks and spots. Was that just like diligent trail cam type stuff? Or are you doing, you know, some, some, um, summer scouting or how, how did you get it kind of like a, I guess like a mental picture of like where some of these deer were going to be? Mainly trail cameras. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty unique because there's a, along the river, there's a big levee that runs the, the edge of the river and it has a road, a, a farm road system. And it's it, that this property is really unique because <clears throat> as a whitetail hunter, I'm very like very cautious about intrusion, about you know education of, of any sort. I'm always cautious. I feel like, and 
Um, it took me a while on this piece of property to realize like, I mean, these roads are getting driven by guys every day checking those wells. And so um, those deer, when they're holed up middle of the day, bedded, I mean, they're in those thick tamarack bushes. It's a jungle. They can't see out, you know, they can't really hear that well in there. So um, what's cool about that levee system is it allows us to, we run cameras along the levee. So in Colorado, you can't use cell cameras, um, okay. which cell cameras have changed changed the game for us in Missouri as far as intrusion, having to check cameras, that type of stuff. Well, you can't run cameras, uh, sell cameras there, but the ability for us to easily check those bro- like cameras right along the road, you can check them as often as you want, every day if you want. And so we don't check them every single day, but um, but having the cameras right along that road system kind of gave us the intel on those deer. And then also there's a quarry on the, on the uh, north side of the property to where um, it has a really great vantage point. And so sometimes if we felt in the morning, which this property, a lot of the deer are out in the field is wide open in the morning, it could be tough to hunt. And so sometimes we'll just not hunt. We'll sit up on that, on that uh, huge rock pile and just glass and watch. And so that's kind of where we gained our intel. We knew most of our trail cam photos were coming from that area. And then we sat on the, on the, uh, on the quarry pile up above and watched uh, watch that field in the morning um, to see kind of the deer clear off what direction they went, where they had to go to bed. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then the buck you ended up, you know, making a play on and hunting, uh, you kind of had some unique access to like, at least the approach that you took when you finally decided like, yep, we're going to go in here and try and make a move on that deer. So maybe go into your thought process um, as it pertains to that. Yeah. So back to the point of the, the property being difficult to hunt in the mornings, uh, you know, I, I, I hate blowing out, you know, the fields that most of the deer come out from the river, from the tamaracks and they're in the fields and the, in the, you know, throughout the night, off and on, they'll bed and get up and go back and forth. But if you just bomb in there in the morning, clear the fields out. I mean, even if, even if you do it in a vehicle, you know, where they're not spooked by hunting pressure, they're still back, you know, they're still bumped off the field. I hate that. So man, we were like trying to figure out, okay, like there's this main core bedding area that we don't really mess with much because it's just difficult to access. And so um, I was like, if we could come in across on the other side of the river, as long as the river wasn't too high, um, we could slip into the backside of this thicket and basically get in there undetected. Like I had zero concern about deer being, you know, in there, you know, bright and early in the morning. And so I actually got permission from the neighboring landowner across the river um, to park and we went and checked and this was on the first trip we checked uh, checked the river I turned on my uh, onyx tracker and like tracked my path I had to kind of zigzag to make sure I couldn't didn't go too deep because there's like deep holes and stuff anyway we got across there hung a setup and um, we knew it would be an awesome spot and so I think we hunted at one time that first um, that first trip and didn't have a didn't have much luck and then flip it around to that eight pointer breaking off his main beam. The next night was the last night of the season. And uh, we actually saw him that night, but he was way off, didn't have a shot opportunity. And so that was it um, for, for our first, first season. So we headed back to Missouri and um, then we came back as soon as rifle season closed and the wind was out of the North, <clears throat> the deer, the deer had been just going nuts on cameras, just like the rut just flipped a switch as soon as, you know, we left, of course. And so we knew that it was going to be pretty hot and heavy. And I knew that that stand was one that I wanted to be in when we got back. Dude, that's so cool. So you guys waited across then. Did you, did you guys just wet weight it? Were you like, nope, we're bringing waiters? Like what were, what, cause I was like, oh, maybe they took a little raft or, but it sounds like you guys just walked it. Yeah. So we, we were able to walk it. I think I'm trying to remember, I think when we hung the stands, we may have like tried and 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 the, the river's used it's pretty uh pretty shallow across the board but there's definitely holes and i think we did it in rubber boots we may have had some trash bags but when <laughs> i but, but in between trips i uh picked up some hip waders um and uh so we were using those hip waders so basically we would just um throw our throw our boots over our sh- over our shoulder and then use these hip waders wade across and then drop them on the other side of the bank and put on our rubber boots gotcha how far out of curiosity like so you know you get across like how far did you go in did you guys like barely go in just like boom we're across let's get up we don't want to you know again alert any of these deer that we've snuck in on you know through the back door or like i guess how far did you go before you sat up set up 
Yeah, not very far at all. Um, the idea was kind of just like minimally intrude into that bedding area and let our wind blow across the river. And that way we didn't have to worry about deer getting downwind of us. There was t- quite a bit of sign where we wanted to be and we hung that spot. Like I would not, I would never hunt this spot, not, not during the rut. Like it was a spot where there's a gas line that runs through. Um, so they had cleared out, you know, these, these cottonwoods and tamaracks through the gas line. And then there's these old swells that the river cut kind of through there. So like, it's almost like rows of trees. And so we hung on the corner there where basically I could see down that gas line. And the whole idea was like a visibility situation to where like, you know, I mean, yes, a buck might walk within bow range, just cruising on the downwind side of that bedding area. But really we want a visibility to see if we see a buck, we can call to him. And that's exactly what happened with this deer. Like would not have killed him otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it, it sounds like everything you described there, why you set up there is why this worked out. Cause the buck wasn't underneath you when you first saw him. No. Yeah, absolutely. So he, he kind of cruised through the middle of that thicket. I would say, I mean, I, I want to say this chunk's probably 80 acres. So it's a big chunk. Um, but I can probably see three, 200 yards, 200 yards up this, 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 uh, clearing. And he was probably 120, 130 when he cut across at first. And I was just watching his body language, you know, trying to figure out, okay, what's he going to do? You know, I, I, I like calling and I don't mind, you know, rattling or grunting, but it's just one of those things. It's like, it's, ne- it's never like my first go-to you can mess things up. So I was just kind of caught, you know, cautious and watching his body language. And I realized, okay, I watched him doing the zigzag, you know, nose down to the ground, zigzag, trying to catch a hot, you know, trail. He, he was like on a trail of a hot dough. And so I was like, man, he's not going to leave that. And the path he's going, isn't going to lead him to us. So grunted literally nothing like death and i'm like grunt 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 and you never know that's like the hardest thing for me is like is like judging their body language like do they hear it or are they just making they make so much noise they don't hear it or do they hear it and not care because they're so involved in like what they're smelling you know and so like you never want to overcall. but i was like man i don't feel like he heard me you know and so finally i hit him with a snort wheeze and he picks his head up and looks back our way and then just goes back down to the trail. And I was like, man, this is going to be, this is going to be tough. And so he keeps going and he exits the clearing. And so I gave him like, I don't know, 15, 20 seconds. And I was like, well, I mean, what do we have to lose here? I'm going to bang the horns. So pick up the horns, hammer them together. And I'm listening, rattling, listening, rattling. I just set them down and I'm sitting there and just wondering like, oh man, did it just slip, slip between our fingers here? You know, super close call. And then all of a sudden I hear some crashing or some like raking of branches or trees or something. And I was like, Oh, I hear something. He's, he's got to come. And so I grabbed my bow and got ready. And sure enough here, boom, here he comes out of those tamaracks and he's got them all hanging on his back, like down his back of his body. He had just thrashed one of those bushes. He was, he was just pissed. And uh, it's amazing how good they are at pinpointing that sound. You know, that's why, you know, it's just, you gotta, you gotta, it just takes, uh, I guess experience and in, in, in situations like these where you learn from to like figure out what's the best situation, but really it's all, it's all very situational, you know? And so, um, you know, just, this just happened to work out good. You know, he, he, he pinpointed exactly where it was. And so I didn't call to him again, as soon as I saw him, you know, breaking his way towards our direction and he came right to the tree. I mean, right to the tree. And of course was going to kind of circle on the downwind side and our wind was kind of quartered to us. And I had some trees in the way. So I was like, all right, like I got to shoot him. As soon as he clears these trees, he's going to have about five, six yards before he catches our wind. And uh, he just did, just did perfect. He was quartered too. But finally, once he got, you know, past that tree, he was broadside. Oh, dude, that's so crazy. What, um, do you, do you recall how, like from the moment you hit the horns, like how long did it take him to kind of get to you or before where you, you saw him and you're like, oh dude, this deer's coming. It felt like an eternity. Um, it always does. I feel like, but it, it was, it was pretty quick. I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't like I, I mean, I, I've had deer like while you're rattling, like running into the, to the rattle and uh, it wasn't like that at all, but I would say probably 30 seconds or so, you know, I set the antlers down, I'm listening, listening. And I, just as I was starting to lose hope, probably <laughs> it was like, start to hear some, hear some crunching. So I'm sure he stopped when he heard the first rattle and probably listened and listened and then thought, okay, maybe that doe went over that direction and these bucks are fighting over or whatever. I'm going to go check it out. So yeah. It's hard. It's hard to beat their nose when they're on a, on a trail like that. They're not, 
there's not much they're going to do to leave that trail, but he didn't have it. You could tell he was like kind of confused. Like, I don't know which direction she went. I don't know if I'm for sure on her. Uh, so it worked, worked out literally perfectly. So, Dude, that's so cool. It was just really neat to watch. And, you know, when you're talking about deer being able to pinpoint two years ago, I was hunting and had like a really, really not, like probably one of the biggest bucks I've seen on public here at home. And like, he was, you know, just going through like 50 yards, like, you know, on a mission and, uh, like, just, like number one, moving too fast for me to shoot. Number two, like, just like, you know, because of the canopy, like I just never would have gotten an arrow through it anyway. And I grunted at him, you know, I'm like, mar, 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 mar. And I'm like, damn it. Like he's gone, you know? And, and he went on his merry way, like on a beeline. I'm like, shoot. Right. And I bet. 10, 15 minutes later, I look over and he heard those grunts. He didn't, I mean, he like zero reaction and he's like up and to my right behind me and the tree that I was in had a branch that like came out this way. So I couldn't turn and, and shoot or even, Uh. and like, actually the moment that I turned my head, I'm like, Oh my God, he's right. Dude, 18 yards. Right. Didn't, and I didn't hear him coming or anything like that. And I'm just like, damn it, you did hear me. Like, and he just like yeah. was right on top. Uh, anyway, didn't get him, but like, you know, some some lessons learned for sure, you know? Yeah, it's amazing, man. Like, yeah, sometimes you don't think they hear you, but they do. And, and they're just, you're not front of mind at the moment, but they may, you know, once they lose interest in something else, come right back on. No, so. And it's funny, man. I've seen them like chasing, you know, following does. Like you see the doe and heat and she's on the trail. And they obviously know that's the doe, but they're so focused on what they're smelling that, that they'll let her kind of just meander on and they're just nose to the ground. You know, they're like, you know, they're not focused on her as visually they're focused on the scent. So it's a wild, wild thing for sure. Dude. It's so crazy. Well, dude, big story, big buck, lots of cool lessons. I like your story better than the one that I just told. Cause yours is the story of the one that didn't get away. Didn't get away. Uh, you made yeah. all the right decisions. So no, dude, I appreciate you. How sharing. much time we got? I could tell you about a hundred of them that got away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, you've got some of those too. Oh, that makes me feel better. Um, no, man, it was, that, that was great. And lots of good lessons and lots of good things to think about as far as, you know, just, you know, tips, tricks, access, you know, thinking outside the box, um, you know, where you, you know, you talked a, a lot about or some, some about like those deer were used to activity on some level. So that kind of gave you some leeway as far as getting some intel there, you know, on, you know, where you were hanging trail cams and being able to check them. So, um, dude, lots of cool stuff there. Like I said, great hunt. Congrats. And, yeah. uh, obviously people, if you listen to this, you listen to it, but if you haven't watched the hunt, go over to the vortex optics, YouTube channel and, uh, check it out. If you like big bucks, like I do, I'll probably go watch it again. So Mike, yep. it's uh, short and sweet worth a watch. <laughs> exactly. Just, just a couple minutes of your time and, uh, lots of good stuff there. So Mike, thank you. Thanks everybody for listening and we'll catch you on the next one. What is up, everybody? We've got Pat Reeve across from us from Driven TV, and he's going to give us a breakdown of the breakdown that he made in the YouTube video that you can watch on the Vortex YouTube channel. And if you follow that, hopefully you follow this, because we're going to talk about a really cool hunt that, uh, like, you know, Pat explains in that video, but we're going to we're gonna go a little bit deeper. We're going to, you know, provide a little bit more detail on it. So, Pat, uh, I watched the video. Awesome hunt. Very exciting. Uh, tell us about, tell us about the flyer buck and, and kind of what you learned about him over the years, um, that, you know, ultimately drove you to, uh, hunt him the way you did. Well, you know, sometimes you get lucky and that, uh, hunting the flyer buck was one of those instances where you had a little luck on our side, but, uh, it's actually a really super cool story. Um, and it just goes to show you when you put in the effort and, you know, you hunt smart, um, chips will fall, uh, in your lap. And that's what happened with this particular buck. And I, you know, a long time ago when I was guiding over in Buffalo County, Wisconsin for Tom Interbo, I learned a lot, you know, I learned the importance of, uh, the use of water holes and providing a water source for deer and, and how to attract them and, and pull them into a particular spot. And, you know, we, we built water holes, you know, way back in the, those, you know, mid nineties and, and late nineties. And, uh, you know, when I started 
managing and developing my own farms here in Minnesota, um, I'd, I wanted to follow that same practice and, and start applying water holes and, and developing food plots and, you know, my hunting strategy on my properties. And, you know, I, I also learned that one thing a deer can't go without is water. I mean, they, they can go without food, especially during the, the rut time, but a buck needs water every day. And um, he, uh, he go, generally speaking, for every 100 pounds of body weight, they go through two to three quarts of water. So that's like six quarts of water a day per buck. Wow. That seems like, yeah, that's a lot of water. And, uh, and so, you know, some of that water they absorb through or, you know, retain through vegetation and stuff that they're eating um you know we're, we're dealing with that right now we're hunting a buck that, that's uh been eating a lot of apples and i don't think he needs as much water because he just gets a lot of you know that water content through the apples but uh anyways um the flyer buck was a buck that um that's in the video um that i learned about when i got permission to hunt a pe- particular piece of property. Um, th- this piece of property was a very large track of property, but the previous hunters on, on the property um, had seen this buck several years in the past and they just could never, you know, get him shot. And, you know, early on they were passing him up. And as he got older, he, you know, became a little more, more elusive. And so, when I started hunting the property, the deer was, uh, believe he was at the age of six and a half. He could have been five and a half, but anyways, he was fully mature. And, you know, the, the guy I was hunting with, um, and was helping us manage the property. Um, he, he told me, he said, this buck really does not live on the particular property that we had permission to hunt. He really was, uh, a neighbor deer and he just kind of jumped back and forth and you would see the deer occasionally on on their property especially during the rut you know he would show up of course you can expect that right because everybody knows that you know you get drifter deer deer that just all of a sudden appear during the rut that you've never seen before and that's because they're out cruising and putting on miles so I th- I would assume that this deer would was no different so um, we strategized a little bit and tried to figure out exactly where this buck was coming from, where he was living and where we could, you know, pro- possibly develop a water hole to hunt this deer over near the, uh, the border of the, the neighboring property where we figured that his core area was. So, um, we identified, we knew what food source he was coming out to mainly at night and we figured if we could catch him a little bit in that transition zone where he was, you know, coming from the property line where he was transitioning through the timber and then out to a food source, um, we decided I found a spot as I walked around, uh, I found a perfect spot to put one of these water holes. So that summer, um, before I hunted him, we went in there and we built a water hole. I built it with my skidster and um, we lined it because we live in the bluff country and we have a lot of rock. So the only way to keep water in it without leaching out is by lining it. And we can talk about what we line it with here in a second. But uh, basically, we, we built the water hole and we seeded down around the edges and we hung our stands. I actually hung two stands, one for hunting them on a northerly, westerly wind, and then we hung a, we hang. We hung another stand set, which we're hanging two sets, two stands in every tree just for the camera man and the hunter. And then we hung one for a more of a southerly wind. Um, that way we had options uh, to hunt either wind situation. But the northern, northerly, westerly wind spot was a better, a better setup but just because the tree was better. It offered a lot more cover and... Uh, we felt like that's the wind that he would use to come in there. It would be in more in his favor as well as he, when he come, come through that area. So, um, yeah, we just hung the stands and we put, uh, our cell cams up and 
We just let them marinate. And uh, that's exactly what happened. That buck, um, ironically, didn't show up for the first couple months on the water hole um, after it was built. And we got, you know, pretty much all the other residential deer, including bucks, some mature, on the water hole. But he didn't, he didn't come in there or didn't find the water hole. But eventually, we got a picture of him there. We're like, aha, there he is, you know. And uh, so once we knew he found it, you know, it would be more now of a waiting game and just, yeah, just watching those cameras, really paying attention to his pattern and seeing, you know, when he would possibly be in there during daylight hours. And, and that's what we did. We just kept watching him. And he would come in there a lot of times at night and uh, he would go out and feed in the food source and then, um, of course, would vanish and probably go back to his core area. Um, but as, as the season went on and in, into uh, the latter part of October, um, he was starting to frequent that more. And I think obviously because there was a great food source, uh, there, a lot of does and he started running scrapes and, and, um, we started getting, you know, uh, that buck more frequently on, on camera. So interestingly enough, um, the guy that I was sharing it with, he's a good friend, uh, you know, kind of helped us set the whole farm up. Um, he, uh, he and I were rotating through hunting um, chances at this buck. And, you know, one day when the wind would, was good to hunt that spot, um, he would hunt it. And then the next day when the wind got good, um, the next time I would hunt it. So I was not only, you know, I was playing chess with the, uh, with a buck that uh, I really wanted to hunt and, and shoot, but I also had to share share that with somebody else. So that that added into the equation. And uh, one night the, the the conditions were right. It was a cool night, and uh, and it was his turn. So I sent a cameraman with him, and the buck came in and came into the water and um, and you know um walked in and the guy just i guess got buck fever a little bit and um the buck kind of turned when he was at full draw so it didn't give him a great angle but he took it and he just basically shanked a shot a little bit and grazed him and uh the buck ran off kind of unscathed of course the video told the story and um, of course, uh, my buddy didn't feel very good about it because he felt like, oh my gosh, the buck of a lifetime like that standing in front of this huge flyer drop tine and he misses them. Um, but I told him, I said, look, you know, that deer, I believe that deer, because that water, that was the only water source on that entire ridge. Um, I said, that deer has got to come back if he's going to, you know, be on top of this ridge because it's the only water around. So, um, we kept watching, of course, the cameras and waited for him to show back up. And sure enough, he did. Took a couple days after that encounter, but um, he started coming back. And then the next time the, the wind got right, I slipped in there um, and got set up. Well, actually, I drove all the way back from, I was in Iowa, southern Iowa, hunting, uh, archery hunting down there. And I realized that the wind would be really good. And so I drove all the way home that day and got in the tree um, in plenty of time to, to hunt that buck. And, and uh, you know, we're sitting there that night and all of a sudden, um, well, we had, a, we had a group of does that came in and then another mature, kind of fairly mature buck came in and started chasing those does around and uh, kind of creating a ruckus, right? Where he was, you know, grunting and, and, you know, you could just hear deer running all over. And all of a sudden my cameraman, as he was filming that, that buck chasing does, um, said, Oh, the flyer, the flyer buck, you know, and he caught him right in the frame of the camera. He just appeared. And, uh, that buck had heard, probably heard all that commotion and came in, you know, I'm sure he was on his way anyways to come and get a drink, but he heard that and, and uh, he kind of stood there, bristled up with that buck for a second and posturing. And then, then it all of a sudden committed to come in to get a drink. And he walked right in into the water hole. And, of course, <laughs> I can tell you my heart was beating uh, fairly fast. And uh, I just, you know, 
kept my cool. Um, I let him drink for, it seems like, an eternity. And then eventually he backed out. And as he started to back out, I came to full draw. And he, as he backed out, he stopped, which he generally do, and looked around. And then I, I 12 ringed him, and he went, you know, 70, 80 yards and was dead. So that that was that. And, uh, you know, kind of a scripted hunt, really. But um, we we didn't get luck. We, you know, we weren't just sitting there along a trail and he just comes sauntering by. We built that water hole specifically to hunt that deer and then to have those encounters and to get them killed. I mean, it, you know, doesn't get any better. That's just the way you hope it goes. And, and the rest is history. Man, dude, I tell you what, you made an awesome shot on that deer and the hunt was just, you know, I know, I know I learned a lot from it. When you, so to me, it sounds like you said, okay, there's this deer, he's close by, he's not necessarily where we get to hunt, uh, and kind of one of those things like, okay, what can we do, what, is the, what does a deer need, and what does the landscape lack that you guys can provide, and it sounded like that was water. Yeah, I mean, I listen, I, I do seminars, I've talked to a million people, and there's a lot of guys now that I think that over the years... Um, have seen what we've done to we this isn't the first year we've harvested uh, on camera over water that was fully mature I mean every year um, if you watch driven you're gonna see us shoot a big deer over water right and there's a reason because deer need water and then and they'd be we can't bait here in Minnesota or, or feed deer it's illegal so we can hunt over water and that's just a drawing card Um you know, we talked about that, you know, last time we, we visited, you know, deer, um, you know, I like manufacturing like water holes and I like making food plots and I like to do them a lot of times in combination and provide the deer a multitude of reasons to come into your location. Of course, we're archery hunting for the most part. So, you know, that gets them close, gets them within range, and it makes them have a purpose to come in instead of just like walking by on a trail or catching them out into a food plot where they can be, you know, well out of range, archery range. This now pulls them into a particular spot. And a lot of times we build these water holes like around great setup trees. You know, I'll walk, a, I'll find a, a ridge um, I'll walk a ridge and go, okay, this would be a great spot for a water, water hole because there's no, you know, cl- close uh, water in any, any of the proximity. So I'll be like, and then I'll start looking around and I'll find a little natural opening in the, in the timber and I'll start looking for the setup tree. And if I find a really good setup tree and there's a little natural opening, I'll be like, this is a good spot. And I kind of also look at the trail systems and how the trail systems kind of come into that area and and figure out where the deer's going to approach from. And, and we knew that where that buck was probably bedding by just past history and where he was coming from. So we kind of already realized that, area, you know, that, that travel route. So, um, you know, that's, that's the thing, you know, just putting these, these water holes in, in your spots. If you don't have water, um, like in the, on your property, um, there's no, you know, there's, that's just a, another great reason to provide that. And uh, you don't have to have a skidster to make a water hole. I'm, I've told that to a lot of guys, you know, some guys, you know, but I'm sure you have a buddy. A lot of guys have buddies that have a skidster. Um, they just move a lot more dirt and can dig it a little bit deeper than you can with a shovel. Um, there's other alternatives out there that guys use. You know, uh, we use a product called an earth pond, and that's a fiberglass liner that's a uh, pre-molded and uh and it looks like dirt feels like dirt and you can even set it on top of the ground and fill it with water and uh the deer will drink out of it um i know guys use decorative ponds as well you know they're black just black tubs um but you gotta those kind of liner ponds and um little tubs and stuff they need a lot more filling manually um, they don't collect rainwater like our ponds do our ponds aren't put into ditches or runoff areas they're just built uh, with the shape of a cereal bowl so they collect enough rainwater annually to generally keep them um, you know full enough that they don't 
ever go dry. Now, this year is an exception because we've had a super dry year. And like I, a lot of the southern states, Kansas, Iowa, and stuff like that, they, they also have a lot of dry periods. So um, we also have a, a 250-gallon water tank that sits in the back of our ranger, and we can fill it up and then just back right up to it and open the spigot and fill it as well. And that's what we've had to do here recently because our water holes are getting so low because we haven't had rain in months um, we just provide, we just go pump water out of, uh, the Creek or uh, I got a pond here in my, at my place and we just go pump that water out and then we fill those water holes. Gotcha. Gotcha. Do you think with that particular deer, um, you changed, like you, you altered where he liked to, to frequent and where he liked to live? Do you think the water actually changed that or was he... Or do you think he was passing through with the same frequency, but you just m- provided a spot where that's where he would stop? Oh, it definitely changed his pattern a little bit because he had to go somewhere to get water. And most likely he went to the bottom of the valley, mm-hmm. which is the opposite direction on the neighbor's property. And he wasn't finding water because I knew the property that we had and didn't have any water sources there. So he wasn't coming our way and finding water. But when we provided it, yeah, it definitely changed his pattern because now he could come, you know, as he transitioned through um, and onto our property, he could find water and then go out to the food source. And it was just a natural, easy way. And I always <laughs> I always tell this in, in my seminars, I'm like, listen, you know, deer are a lot like humans. I said, so let's just say you have a two-story house and uh, your master bedroom's upstairs and you're thirsty and you get up in the middle of the night. What do you do? You generally will walk into the upstairs bathroom, get a drink if you're thirsty, and then go back to bed, right? You don't want to go all the way down the steps to the kitchen sink and get a drink. But that's what, and that's just how my philosophy is for deer, because if you provide that water source near close to them bedding areas that the deer, it's easy for them to access versus going all the way down the hill to the bottom of the valley to get a drink and then back up, um, they'll do it because it's obviously, you know, providing that easiness to it. So, um, and that's, that's the way... I see it generally rolling. Um, that's where we're building these water holes. Not in the bedding areas, but in those transition areas where we can slip in undetected. You know, we build a little trail system, a lot of times back in the timber, into areas that are kind of right on the edge of being thick. Uh, I don't put them in the wide open timber. Um, I like to get them tucked in so a buck, when he comes through that thick stuff, he steps out and he's right at the water hole and bam, here, you know, you've slipped in the opposite way and you're set up on him. So, you know, of course, we always pay attention to the wind. I told you before we hung two setups, one for each wind there. And uh, yeah, we we hunt them and, and we do it very effectively. And what a great place to monitor, you know, all the all the deer activity and see, you know, inventory what kind of deer are on your property because, like right now, you know, I just checked my cameras this morning. I'm looking at my, and all the, our water holes are just lit up because, of course, it's dry and uh, the deer are just on them constantly. So you're just, you know, getting lots of photos and, and uh, being able to see what bucks are doing what and when they're on their feet. Is that primarily when you're going to hunt? A water source then is like it's either you know hot and dry or maybe just dry for an extended period of time or during like the rut like periods of high exertion high activity you know they're going to be need to drink more well i i hunt them all all season um okay. you know early, early season it's generally warm and uh evening sets the first thing that a lot of times the deer will do is get up and and come and get a drink before he goes out and feeds so you bet and i and of course they're in areas where they're in those transition areas or on the edge of a food plot. That's the other thing. Sometimes I, I put these water, water sources, right? Like on the edge of the food plot where I can archery hunt both the food plot and the, and the water hole. So it kind of gives it a double whammy. So the reason for them to come. And then sometimes I set them back in off the food plot as well. So 
when a deer comes and gets a drink, he leaves my area, then goes out to the food source, and then I can slip out of there. And he never knows that I'm hunting him. Of course, keeps the hunting fresh. So that's also a nice way to, to go as well if you got that that amount of property to do that. But yeah, I see that know. being you know a great idea when you know you're not going to want to shoot every deer that stops, right? So then yeah. you're not you don't have deer in the area where you're trying to bug out. You know they've already passed through, and like you said, you can keep it fresh. That's cool. I like that. Yeah, you know, we talked about keeping them fresh before. It's, a, you know, that's that way you're always hunting deer that, that are never, they never feel the pressure. They they don't know they're being hunted. So, um, yeah, I mean, these these things, uh, like I said earlier, you know, when we build these things, we build them. They're, they're probably, if I had to guess in size, they're like a, a, a 30 by 30 area, uh, 30 feet by 30 feet. They're again, shaped like a cereal bowl. I build them about four feet deep in the center, taper the edges. And really what I do is when I come in there, I just start scooping dirt in a circle. And then I take the, the good dirt that don't have any debris in it, whether it's rock or, or uh, logs or whatever, and I set it off to the side. Basically, that's topsoil. <clears throat> Make a pile. And then I, when I dig down, of course, we got rock here, so I get the rocky stuff, and I set that off to the side because I ain't going to use that again. Um, once we get it dug deep enough, we kind of dig it about another uh, foot deeper than we really want it to finish at. And then um, I come in there, and I sprinkle in some good, clean dirt on the bottom so it's got a good bed to lay on. And then I go in there with my four-wheeler and kind of you know, feather it out and pack it down. And so now I got a clean, like a perfect cereal bowl that's just uh, hard dirt that's packed down. Usually that dirt's fairly moist anyways because it's, you know, that deep. And then that four-wheeler packs it down nicely. I just pick any sharp objects that might be poking through the, the soil, throw them out of there. And then we lay that, I, I go by a, simply buy a tarp, a heavy milled tarp from a farm store. And I buy like an eight mill tarp or, or better and you know they're about 100 bucks 150 bucks sometimes to i buy like a 20 by 30 and if you can get a 30 by 30 great um but um i lay that tarp in there and i fold in the corners because the colder corners are a lot of times folded out above you know over the the top of the lip of the the pond and then um we take start taking that clean dirt and we start locking those top edges in so now that the tarp can't slide down um, as we start backfilling. And then we just backfill about a 12 to 18 inches of dirt back on top of it. And then we come in there and we pack it down. Um, after we, we got a lot of times hand shovel it into the center because you don't want to drive the skidster, of course, on, on the tarp. So we just flip the dirt in there with a bucket and then, uh, you know, shovel the stuff in the center and then we come in there and we pack it down and then we take a drag and go around the, the top and on the outer edges and throw some, uh, a lot of times we put clover and, uh, you know, maybe oats or ryegrass or something along the edges. So it gives it, uh, you know, that, that stuff grows and it becomes a little bit of a food source attraction. Sometimes the area is fairly big, so it does become a, a great food, food source as well. Um, but yeah, then, uh, you know, I know. I've actually went and filled them right away or just wait for rainfall because as soon as it starts to rain, it's going to start collecting water, of course, because the water can't get out of it. But that tapered edge creates a nice way for deer to follow that down to the to the water line. Um, and it also doesn't create a mud bank, which uh, is super important for people because I get a lot of questions about EHD and uh, are these ponds promoting EHD. Well, there's no mud banks like, um, you know, most places that, that have EHD issues have. So there's it's basically a hard bank system right to the water's edge. And, of course, no mud for the gnats to hatch out or the nymphs to hatch out on. So that, uh, that becomes uh, beneficial because, you know, Again, they're not EHD. They don't, you know, promote the EHD uh, problem. So, um, yeah, and then, they, of course, as evaporation takes place or or the deer drink it down, that they, they just follow the water line down all the way to the bottom. I like it. I like it, Pat. I like it a lot. Make pond, fill with water, shoot deer. I like it. Uh, you, uh, 
I mean, you built this this pond for a, you know a specific buck, but like what since then? Like what have you seen on this on that spot? Like have you shot a, you know other good bucks off that same hole? Oh, uh, they yeah. I mean, they just become. A, a stopping point for for all deer you know the more that the deer get used to it and and find it the more they'll use it and you know i've had ponds now for the same pond for 20 years and in, in one spot and of course it's just the course the trails and stuff that come in there are amazing but yeah i mean it, it's just a it's just something they're going to use all the time and um you know shot many big bucks over the same water hole consistently and um it don't take them long to find it either you build one they they're on it probably a lot of times before there's even water in it but uh yeah i mean they like i said you can inventory pretty much all the deer on your property for sure and then even the ones that are not on your property so it's just another way of drawing deer onto your property and you again you don't have to have a large chunk of property um people ask me too well what if i got a lot of water on my property that's great. I mean, it's it's fine. And in Minnesota here, we have a lot of farm ponds that are built out in in the wide open to stop erosion. You know, they're built there in the seventies a lot of times to you know contain the erosion in the in our large ditches and stuff and stop the water. And deer use those as well, but they got to go out in the wide open. Now I'm creating a water source that's back in near the bedding area, in the food these little food plot areas that they'll go to first before they'll walk wide in the wide open or say they don't want to go down the down to the bottom of the valley to get a drink because there's a a stream um you know they they just use these things more because they're um in a in a spot that's convenient for them yeah um, convenient and secure right like you know a deer might right. go drink in one of those other spots but it ain't going to be during daylight it ain't going to be right after it gets out of his bed right and uh, heck my it, we built one for my son on a on a piece of property that he hunts, um, and and there's a Class A trout stream running right through it, and he has a food plot uh, twenty yards from the from this trout stream. I mean, you you can drink out of the trout stream yourself; it's that clear. Um, but he goes, Dad, do you think a pond would work? I said, Well, heck, let's try it and see see what happens. Because I've learned a long time ago that for some reason these deer really like drinking out of this stagnant, mucky water that they pee in. <laughs> and then I'm like, I don't. And they you, they would pass up drinking on a much colder, clear, freshwater stream. And so we built that pond, and and the deer will go there ten times over, and they drink out of that out of that stream. And I. You know, I was always puzzled by why they would do that. But uh, a guy, I talked to a, a biologist and explained to me, you know, that there's a couple reasons. He said most of the time it's because of the taste. Um, the leaf matter breakdown and um, the mud and stuff getting stirred up provides them a mineral taste that they like and crave and um, versus, you know, a stream doesn't. So they like it. And uh and of course, they play around in it. It just becomes that calling card. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they've obviously been very effective for us. I like it. Holy mackerel, Pat. Tons of great information there. I appreciate you sharing that with us and making the video. So you can kind of, you know, it's like a, it's like a watch and learn. You know, you watch and learn from the video, and then you listen and learn from the podcast recap because you can just fill in a lot of those really cool gaps. So, man, I appreciate you recapping that for us. Like I said, tons of great information. Uh, man, you got me thinking about water holes i guess i need to buy a piece of property so i can put one in so uh, yeah or you go to your buddy's place and tell him you'll put in a water hole if he lets you hunt <laughs> that's there another great idea but uh awesome pat well man thank you again uh we are in the heart of deer season right now so good luck to you i know you're in kansas now you're back in minnesota you know just just chasing deer all around the country so good luck to you keep us posted on on how you do and until next time guys uh put in some water for your deer we'll catch you on the next one what is up, everybody? Mark on the mic here. I am joined by Lee from Seek One today. Now, now Lee put together a really cool video. It's a hunt video breakdown of an amazing deer. You can watch that on our YouTube channel. It's part of a compilation of hunt breakdowns. But we're on the podcast today further breaking down that hunt. We're breaking down the breakdown. 
Lee, what's going on, man? That was that was an amazing hunt. Give us give us kind of like a, a quick recap, and then I've got some questions for you to kind of uh, dive a little bit deeper. Yeah, this was a spot in Tennessee um, that I got door knocking, and I had this spot for probably this is either my fourth or my fifth year. Um, I've put a lot of time into this place uh, over the four or five years. I've never killed a deer there. Uh, I was doing a food plot in there every year, doing a big mock scrape in the middle of the food well, micro plot. It's a small piece of piece of property and it was kind of wedged in a, in a Creek bottom that was basically a funnel between two large blocks of woods on the East and West. And they were funneling in between uh, where I, I was at. And so it was a, it was a really good pinch. And I'd, I'd hunted there a lot over the years. I've, I've put an extreme amount of time and effort into this place. Um, and I've hunted a, you know, a handful of different deer in that area, never had anything, um, happen, just a lot of the cat and mouse going on in that area. And, uh, this buck was, I had pictures of him last year and he was, you know, 130, 140 at the most. Um, but he had like split G twos and he had like five brow tines, but just like, you know, small and young. And I knew that deer had the right stuff in him. Uh, and if he just got some age on him, he would be, you know, something wild. And so fast forward to the next year, um, you know, he's kind of the deer I'm wanting to find and, and sort of, you know, focus on. I end up getting pictures of him, um, in this area, probably, uh, somewhere around a mile away. Uh, these deer have really small core areas that time of year. It's, uh, that, that Tennessee velvet season is like the last week in August. So these deer are definitely still in their summer, summertime patterns. And this deer was like a mile away at one of my other spots, uh, super, super inconsistent. Um, and basically like, you know, I'd spent my whole summer trying to put myself in position to hunt that deer and he blew up. I mean, he ended up being over 190. Um, and a part of me when I was first seeing him, I was like, he's four. If I let him go, like he'll still be, I, I, I think he still had, you know, stuff left in the tank, but, uh, there's just no way you can, you know, let a deer like that go. There's a lot of other hunting pressure in that area. And so the odds of him making it was super slim. Um, so anyways, he's, he, you know, had all my attention. Um, I thought the deer was like one seventies, you know, but he ended up being way bigger than I thought. And I was trying to my best to get on that deer all summer, like try to get a plan for him. And the only place I was getting pictures of, of him, you know, somewhat consistent. It was like once a week, maybe in daylight, maybe not like just extremely inconsistent, but there was a chance there. So I had a set hung in that place, you know, and that was kind of what my intention was, was just to hunt there and, you know, take a, an extreme chance that maybe he, you know, happens to walk through. Well, the night before the season, this other spot I've had for four or five years that I've always done a food plot and the scrapes and all this stuff, uh, a really nice eight pointer shows up that I've also got history with and, uh, pass on this big eight pointer, two seasons prior. And, uh, he hunkered more in that area. I spent more time in that area of, of where that little spot was of mine. And so my attention like totally shifted to the, the big eight. Um, so I'm hunting this other spot away, you know, a mile away from where this, you know, big one ninety was spending most of his time. And, uh, the first, first morning we're hunting, hunting, I've got a trail camera, a couple, few hundred yards up the creek the big eight shows up on that creek or on that camera above me so i'm like okay he's he's still here you know hopefully this evening he'll feed all his way down the creek just like he did the night before and so i'm in this spot and i'm totally focused on this big eight like the the big the big deer i kill was wasn't even on my mind at all it okay was just, you know very very far in the back of my mind the the big deer came to the spot i was hunting but he came like one time five weeks prior. Uh, and then he spends his time there during the season when they start to, you know, bump those. And so in, in the back of my mind, I was like, I'll, you know, maybe I'll get a chance to get back on that deer later in the year. Um, so that, 
the big deer that I ended up killing at that spot had not showed up for, I think it was over five weeks. Uh, it had been five weeks since, you know, you know these deer in the summer, they kind of make their laps. Like they'll break out of their summer area. They'll, they'll sort of do a loop, just kind of almost checking their, their ranges and, uh, you know, maybe laying eyes on it for the first time in a few months, just kind of getting, getting a feel for, you know, if anything's changed or whatever. I, I think that that's literally in June when I got my picture of him, uh, I think that's what he was doing. He was just doing one of his loops. And I think, you know, this five, six weeks later, I just got complete, completely lucky. That's literally all there is to it that he just broke out to do another loop. And the one day he wanted to stroll back through and check this area, I happened to be in the tree. So I'm, I'm focused on the way my stand is sitting. I'm overlooking this Creek and to my right is where this eight pointer is like, that's where he's betting at. And he's working this way down the Creek. So all my attention is focused over to the right. And I see this, I see a deer coming from my left. And then I see, you know, that it's a, big racked deer and i immediately just thought it was the eight and i was like my first thought was oh he looped around somehow and so i'm thinking it's the big eight and when this deer turns like he has a distinct flyer on his g2 and when i saw that flyer it immediately clicked in my head i was like holy crap that's the the big big deer the one that i you know was trying to get on that i've kind of given up for the time being and uh it was just one of those meant, meant to be things like better to be lucky than good. Uh, I cannot, you know, attribute it to anything except it was just luck. Like, it wasn't like I had a gut feeling of, Oh yeah, I need to, you know, that big deer is going to come over here. Blah, blah, blah. It's just like, I wasn't even hunting that deer. Um, and so it was just, it was one of those rare, just like those almost once in a lifetime surprise, you know, kind of deals where like, you know, that, that buck you knew about or hadn't seen in a while, like just boom, just all of a sudden and just, just there. And it just like all the stars align. Um, and he ended up, he ended up being like way, way bigger than I thought. So it was, it was, uh, it was pretty freaking awesome. That's super cool, man. And, and you answered one of my biggest questions. I'm like, okay, early hunt, late August, hot, you know, small, you know, small home range, like these deer aren't moving that far. I'm like, why the heck? Like, what was making you go, yep, I'm going to go hunt this deer this far away from where I think he is, you know, that night versus like, hey, you know what? Like, I think my best crack at this deer is going to be whatever during the rut. Like, maybe he's going to, you know, cruise over here and check for does or something like that. So, um, right. like you said, I mean, that's super cool though. Obviously you're on another really big deer, but the stars aligned and you know, they did for sure. I've kind of pondered this too. Like I'm always trying to understand deer as best I can. Um, this deer was in a bachelor group of like five bucks. The one I killed, he was not the dominant deer. There was an older buck in his bachelor group that would bully him around. And so I'm almost, I think one of two things happened. I think I caught that buck when he was doing one of his loops, the breakout loops from their summer patterns, like I told you about, or they had just gotten so close to getting to hard horn and that deer is just continuing to bully this other one that he was kind of like, you know what? I'm not going to really hang out with you guys anymore. I'm going to kind of do my own thing. Cause he wasn't with that bachelor group. He was with a small buck, you know, kind of by themselves. And so I think one of those two things happened that he either did his breakout loop or he did, he he basically got kicked out of that bachelor group was like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. And just kind of went to doing his own thing and left the little summer, you know, hideout area that he had and was kind of exploring a little bit more. So I don't know what it was, but I'm glad that it happened. Yeah, man. I mean, I think both those are, you know, very good hypotheses, you know, and I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, that, does make a lot of sense you know deer that time of year they've been in their little summer bachelor group for you know the summer and then they get to that point where they're just like yeah you know we're gonna we're gonna part ways here and maybe you just caught him when he just like you said branched off and was doing that and maybe that was gonna be a little bit more where he ended up where you killed him maybe that was gonna be kind of a little bit more of his home range you know for for that time period um yeah what did you have and what'd you have planted in your micro plot so I, I typically do a, um, my, my food plot had actually had not taken that well 
that early. I, I do wheat. Uh huh. Um, the stuff grows like, I mean, it, it grows like a weed, like a, a lot of my micro plots, I'll take a leaf blower. I'll just blow the leaves off. I don't even break the ground. I don't even, I don't even try and like plant the seed. I just take these, this bags, bags of wheat and just fan cast it. And I'll do it really, really thick. And as soon as it gets rain, it just starts popping up like carpet. Like if I spill it in the bed of my truck, it grows in the bed of my truck. Oh my gosh. So, you know, I just, I just will do It's It's a really easy sort of micro plot to do. Uh, it's just to fan cast that wheat, but, uh, th- that wheat typically you need a little bit cooler temperatures. It does better in the in cooler temps. That little low lying bottom area stays cooler and I can typically get a plot in there kind of earlier in the summer, but it was just, it was so dang hot. Uh, as soon as the plot came up, it just kind of burnt out and all died. So I was basically hunting over just a dead, dead plot, but it was still a really good travel area, you know, just a, a funnel between two large blocks of woods that they like to kind of travel in between. And if they were going to get from point A to point B on these larger blocks, they have to come through this little funnel like right on top of it. So, um, it's just, it's, it's one of those just honey hole, like really ideal spots. Um, it just sets up super, super well. And then you had the Creek in the bottom there. Um, so obviously, you know, source of water for them to drink out of, did did the Creek like cause that to pinch down even further than like if a, if a deer was going to be on that side, like how important was the Creek being there? So the, the Creek was super important for a couple of reasons. One, it made it really like, I mean, it's hot that time of year. Like it's brutally hot. And this area is like really overgrown. It's got a thick canopy. It's shaded. And that, that Creek has a really strong flow of fresh water coming through it. And it's just cool. It's a lot colder in that area. Um, and then the other thing that was the benefit is, uh, you know, there's, there's developments on, on either side of that Creek. So they can't build in this, these low, you know, floodplain areas but they'll build as close as they can, as they can. So it just creates like, you know, it was between developed neighborhood, developed neighborhood. They can't build on this Creek. So it just forms a natural funnel where they're kind of being forced between this, you know, kind of 60 to 70 yard, you know, area kind of funneling through before they can open up into the bigger woods. So uh, it was a couple of things. I mean, it was, creating the perfect pinch because they can't develop there and that's just a natural funnel but two having that low lying creek area that that cooler temperature and cold water like those deer really take to it that time of year they really like those those areas and they'd move there middle of the day i mean they just kind of kept meandering around in that low lying just you know cold area so um that was the main ingredients for kind of why those deer were there in the in the summer um, they had extremely thick cover and can just disappear in that stuff and never be seen. And, uh, it just, you know, but, but like I said, you know, I've hunted that place pretty much every summer for four or five years, never had a chance. It was just, you know, total, total luck that one of those bucks that I knew and, you know, that was working that area just happened to come through. So, you know, speaking to the time of year. Uh, is the reason you're choosing to go after those deer that time of year, is it because it's kind of like the first crack out of all the states or is there a reason why you like to be in, in that state at that time? It's the first crack out of all the states pretty much. Um, a velvet deer is a rare opportunity. And so it's exciting to, you know, try and go after a deer like that. But, um, Basically, it's it's the first crack of all, all the states to open up. It kind of kickstarts our season, and if you can if you can get the right spot, I mean, it's location, location, location. If you can get the right spot and land right on top of them, like you're in the money. I mean, they are very predictable that time of year for the most part. They've got a pattern they're sticking to. They've got a small area they're sticking to. They've got a routine they're doing, and if you can get the right place i mean if i had a spot further up the creek in this thick bedding where this big eight was i I, he'd have been done i mean i knew exactly where he was betting and spending his time but it was just unaccessible but 
that time of year, I mean, we do a ton of door knocking and it's like, you just, you, you find that one out of a hundred spots and like, you know, it's freaking game on. So that's kind of the allure of it all is like, you know, you might get 20 spots and they're all trash and you get that one spot. It's just like you landed right on top of them. And then like your odds of seeing that deer that time of year, if you're in the right place are extremely high. How far in general would you say, like when you're saying like, you got to be on top of them, like how, when you're in the tree, how far away do you think that deer is? And how far do you think they're going to move during daylight? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's dependent upon the environment and the scenario. Um, I think the deer in, in the particular area I was at, I think they, so, sometimes like as small as a hundred yards, like having a camera a hundred yards on this side of the Creek and a hundred yards on this side of the Creek is the difference in even knowing whether that buck is there or not. Um, so sometimes it's, it's a, a distance of yards can make a difference, but, you know, I, I think on average, uh, you know, we also hunt some big bean fields over there and, uh, on several hundred acres and like in a big bean field like that, you know, they may pop out of a tree belt and, and walk, you know, five, <coughs> excuse me, five, 600 yards easily in a nighttime, but you know, sometimes an urban environment, like they'll, they'll move as little as just a couple hundred yards. Um, these deer are experts. I, I don't care whether it's urban, rural, like these deer are experts at finding the nooks and crannies where they never, ever, ever get messed with. They're just, their ability to find those untapped places where they never get bothered is unbelievable. And it's like, once you discover that, if you play it right, you know, that's, that's like everything to, to kill, you know, a big mature deer. How, uh, how high in the tree were you? How, how far was that shot? That shot was like 15 yards. Um, he was close. I mean, we're, I was, I was, uh, kind of at the top of this little berm that was overlooking this Creek area. Mm -hmm. It's like, I really wasn't super high in the tree, but from where my stand was above where these deer were standing was extremely high. Gotcha. Um, so, you know, I, I'm always an advocate of getting as high as possible in a tree where, like where I'm hunting in Kentucky right now, it would shock you how high we are, but I still had a buck two nights ago. The first thing he did when he walked in, when he just goes, Oh, and looks, I mean, like about broke his neck trying to look up so high, but they'll, they'll still find you. And, uh, it's funny, like I hunted Kansas this year and those deer don't look up at all. I could be five feet off the ground and they don't care. Yeah. It's so crazy how that differs, you know? It's cool though. What, um, they're just, their products are their environment. So yeah, yeah. True that, uh, big velvet buck, right? Like kind of, uh, kind of a rarity, but you know, and I'd say like, even in, you know, Wisconsin, like there's potential, you like, you're likely not going to shoot a velvet buck when our season opens, you know, like. Oh, I don't know. Like, you know, it opens like generally about mid September ish. Right. But it's a possibility. Or you go to a state like Kentucky, you shoot a velvet buck and then it's like, now what? Right. Like when you're trying to preserve that velvet, um, like what did you do to make sure that that didn't get damaged and that got well preserved, you know, so it doesn't, you know, rot or things like that. So dealing with velvet deer is actually kind of a pain. Uh, there's a lot more of a process to, um, you know, preserving those deer than, than your hard horn deer. Um, you can't really drag them by the horns. It's kind of an ordeal, but what you want to do is like, you know, I got a buddy who's a, a taxidermist who's kind of local. And, uh, the first thing he'll do is I think some people freeze dry them like instantly. It's like the first thing they'll do, but, uh, I don't really know what his process is, but I just try to get it to him as quick as he can so he can start his process. And I know they have to like get rid of all the blood you know, out of, out of the antlers. So they, they treat it somehow to just kind of dry and soak up all that blood. Um, but it's, it's, it, there's a, there's a very di a big difference from, you know, when you kill a deer and how much mass and how much is in that velvet versus when you get it back from the taxidermist, like it's, it's, it's significantly tighter to the antlers and it loses a lot of mass. Um, 
So I, I'm not exactly sure what the process is, but I know that the process before getting it to a, uh, a taxidermist is, it, it, it's a pain. Like we killed a deer in North Dakota and we had a probably like a close to a mile hike out. Um, I think it was just shy of a mile. And this deer was in velvet and he was a, you know, big body deer. And like, we can't drag, he's grabbed by the horns and two dudes take off. You know, we were trying to do whatever we could to like preserve it as best we can. We ended up damaging it a little bit, but we found the best way to do it was to literally take the deer and throw it on our back. And we, we gutted it. So it was lighter food on our back. And I had my arm kind of over his neck that was kind of holding his head steady. And we just like carried it out. So, um, yeah, preserving the velvet is a huge pain. I, honestly, like, I feel like I've gotten my fair share of velvet. I'd rather just kill him and, <laughs> and hard work, grab a hold of him, start dragging. Yeah, it, I mean, it is tricky. And I think, you know, for a lot of folks, it's not something you put a lot of thought in, bef- you know, beforehand. And then you're kind of like, oh, awesome, neat. Uh, now what? You know, and then you're like, oh, this is fragile. And like you said, like, okay, well, normally where I might grab a deer by the horns and drag him out now i can't really do that you know so it's like oh do i need to yeah. do i need to break this deer down so i can carry it out separate or you know just uh just uh man up and carry the whole deer out apparently lee uh but uh <laughs> uh it's tricky and i'd say yeah i mean that's a good tip if you do have a taxidermist in the area who you think you might take it to you know maybe get with them and you know ask them you know what they need from you on the front end you know i mean there's different products like you know velvet velvet lock velvet lock and um like you said yeah. some some you know i mean there's there's some other methods too like you know the tax armors might freeze dry it you know you could get it in your freezer potentially on the front end you know just make sure get it cooled off as soon as possible so something to be think about if, right. you, if you shoot that velvet buck for sure yeah i mean i think honestly the probably the best way to do it if you if you can do it quick is to probably cape them out and cut them off you know just below the head to where you can, you know, kind of carry them out carefully. Cool, man. Well, heck, I appreciate you, you know, uh, going into that hunt. I mean, it sure was a cool hunt. It was awesome to watch. Like I said before, check it out on our YouTube channel. You can probably check out the full thing on your YouTube channel as well. But, um, yeah, just a lot of really good information, exciting stuff. Uh, Lee, appreciate it. That concludes that concludes our hunt breakdowns of the hunt breakdowns. Check them out on the podcast. Check them out on YouTube all the other platforms that we got going on here. And, uh, yeah, until next time, good luck out there, everybody. 